aspects of it. Access to this section of the uh, tunnel is, is gained from Alfred Street, so the return journey to get equipment down there is about six miles. So it's quite a significant undertaking. What came forward was a three-phase program over a six-month period. So within section 3.12 of the report, phase one is a six-week period going from January, 3rd of January to 12th of February. And that will see all the Royal train lines terminating at Birkenhead Central and Birkenhead North with no services running into Liverpool or around the underground loop. Passengers will transfer onto an express uh, rail replacement service to complete their journey and they'll have a bus sh shuttle service to link uh, the passengers between stations. Merseyfred will also play a part in that in terms of offering <laughs> that journey as part of, particularly people with cyclists, as part of the option of the transport plan we're seeking to put in place. The second phase is a 15 week period and it covers from the 13th of February to the 30th of May. And that covers uh, cross services which resume Terminate James Street but at platform two uh, uh, at weekends only. So what, what you've got there is only at weekends would have that full replacement service again. Uh, Monday to Friday would have access to that station. In phase three, which is the 31st of May to 18th of June, the transport plan would mirror what was phase one. So six week full closure in phase one, three week closure in phase two. A key part of that work is, is, is the disruption. So Mersey Travel will be working closely with Mersey Rail and Network Rail to develop a robust, appropriate transformation and communication plan to support the works, to develop solutions that allow the numerous journeys that passengers would consider that need to be taken to travel both between Liverpool and the world. These are based on key principles. First one is keeping the city region open for business. So the movement, either travel to work, leisure, or access services can be undertaken. Yes, there will be some disruption. Part of that is putting detailed planning in place to allow that work to be to be undertaken in the minimum timeline. A strong focus will be on high quality alternative accessible transport and that's the replacement support services. Partnership working is, is key to delivering the scheme and with Emergency Travel, Network Rail and Mersey Rail, the partnership we've been working with with key stakeholders, we have certain governance arrangements already in place. The Major Events Transport Board, the Joint Agency Group, the Joint Communication Group and Strategic Stakeholder Group. These underpin what we're developing to put in place as part of our robust plans. So Mersey Travel's focus is to coordination and ensure engagement of key wide stakeholders to enable the dissemination of information and the promotion of one source for the truth during these works. Consideration has all been given by ways in which Mersey Travel can support the mitigation of this, so the movement of people over this, over this period. So what we have done is we've used the Liverpool City Region Transport Model to look at the impacts of movement of passengers currently using the rail network and then to model that onto prediction of movement of passengers onto other modes. And this is one of the bases, a key basis of which we've sought to put the plans of uh, remedial transport plans into place. As part of the work under section 4.1 there is a, a financial provision that's been agreed at the time that Mersey Travel would make available because as issues emerge from something of this nature, there may well be delays where, where that responsibility for payment of those would lie. So what's been agreed is that there'll be a centralised pot so that when we work through the compensation aspects of network rail structure, which can take quite a bit of time, it doesn't prevent the, it doesn't prevent the right solutions and quick decisions to be allowed to be put into place. The works will have an effect, so one of the key uh, stakeholder uh, meetings and discussions are with main employers and seeking employers to play their part, where perhaps they could be more flexible with workers as to the time of travel, perhaps travelling from home. And that includes our own organisation, because HR from uh, our own organisation have been around to the service heads to, to discuss the same uh, options to mitigate some of the impact of the works. In terms of the risk itself, um, we have a Liverpool City Region Programme Board. It meets in, on a, a monthly basis with directors from Network Rail and has been doing for quite some considerable time. So that allows both the governance arrangement to be put in place 
and our own program management office to interface with the plans that are being put in place to achieve that delivery of that six month work. The key risk is the transport plan. The key aspect of the transport plan is to minimise people turning to the vehicle. So out of the journeys that we've estimated of people that were looking to, to take advantage of the uh, alternative transport modes, if much more than 10% of that turned to car, that would be uh, quite challenging on congestion through the tunnels. So our key aim of the strategy, the demand strategy going forward, is to offer clear direction as to the best choice of travel, but also to recognise that we need mitigation, which we've got in our plans, because when we've done the transport model, not only have we picked up which malls we predict the movement may occur, we've also predict, predicted which highways will become further congested and what measures we can put in place to seek to alleviate that. So that, very, that detailed transport plan went through the joint advisory group, and that's all the districts and Mersey Travel and the uh, train operators and bus operators are on to, to have their inputs to try and mitigate that plan, and that is one of our key aspects. Part of the structure is to put a transport coordination centre in place and what that needs to do is that will give that overview of the plans that are in, that are in place but also give an intelligence of what's actually occurring quickly that we can make further decisions. For example, if we were looking at Old Haymarket and that was particularly congested, should we have police out there? Should we have an immediate response? That would be one of the mitigations. If the tunnels uh, were excessively congested, another incident might occur, we've had that before, what could we do about that? We'd have to look about the barriers and how we move vehicles through the plaza. So what we've got is a series of sensitivities we've looked at about different scenarios that may come up and how we might respond to that. Under Section 7 on the, on the communication, the, the City Region Communication Group has been established with Mersey Travel and Network Rail working together and the wider region and operator partners. To, to, to develop a comprehensive plan. Part of the debriefs of that plan, the comms plan, there has been some discussions uh, with um, the press, which is starting today, in terms of Frank and Liz attending that, and uh, briefing, uh, if you like, in advance of a formal launch of the uh, proposals for the transport plan, which will take place on Monday. One of the aspects of that is a very detailed booklet that sets out all the goals of transport the possible modes so that people see very detailed what the options will be from the various parts of the city region that they may be looking to travel. The scheme itself, as we remind, is part of the overall £350 million investment scheme. It's a significant scheme. This is a significant <coughs> challenge for a six month period. We've got other challenges in the pipeline for Lime Street both in 2017 and 2018. And some of the aspects of what we're putting into place here, hopefully the coordination and, and communication plan, allows a platform for what we will do going forward for land streets in 2017 and 18. The challenging work delivers a substantial transformation of our railway system, but it needs that supporting robust engagement which we're currently underway. Happy to take any uh, questions, Chairman. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Shane. I've certainly got Gordon.
two of the stakeholder groups. Uh, besides meeting uh, major employees, we've also met uh, the uh, cycling focus group and disabled focus group. So those were met over the last five weeks so that they have input into the plans and proposals. Um, Mercer Rail play a key part. They, those, those discussions have been ourselves at Mercer Rail primarily fronting that so that we understand what the challenges will be and try and mitigate that before we put the plan out as part of this booklet that's going out on, on Monday. Uh, comments about programme, couldn't deny the challenging network builds. So we've, we've got um, our own um, programme office that will be challenging network rails programme. We will be looking to make sure that we understand the key milestones, that we will achieve that phase one in six weeks, second phase according to that timeline, and the final phase could we do it in less than three weeks? And to a large extent, that's about getting the logistics out and back up to surface and out to having the service available for, for running. So we've, we've got a very keen interest. We have a, I mentioned we have a, the directive that we meet every month, so that will be, I assure you, a dashboard as part of that when we look to, to track it. The other incentive for Network Rail, all these costs of disruption are under schedule four costs of, of Network Rail that they have to pay the train operating company and they have a real incentive not to exceed the timelines. Uh, so they've got these two aspects. One is a robust program, and two is significant uh, financial impacts should they exceed any of those timelines. Steve? Yeah, it, it, um, this is a disruption that has got to take place. Um, we are you know, in the stages now of going out to widespread consultation. And my, my first issue was about I talk to people at my workplace at Humanly who come over the water to, to work there in large numbers and actually they're blissfully ignorant of, of anything coming around the corner. You may have, the odd one may have seen a, he, a, a headline. So it's important that we get to each and every one of those so they can make alternative arrangements. But it's also drawn in, it brought to me in star focus really of how essential all these links under the water are, both the two uh, road tunnels and, and the, the rail tunnel, because even with all the planning in the world, there will be major disruption. So when we have debates in this chamber about the tunnels, the one thing our sort of duty is to keep the tunnels moving, because we're seeing a planned disruption. So any, any money we spent on preventive maintenance in the road and rail tunnels is money well spent. So when we have our debates, it's, it's just important to, to refocus ourselves and say what our main duty I also do see um, a glimmer of sort of light here, if you like, in terms of people being really interested in the ferries. It might be a, a, a renaissance for, for, for Mersey ferries in terms of those who go on that, particularly cyclists, which have become more and more popular. So really, uh, you know, I will be seeking assurance that we are getting, uh, as I said earlier on in a, in, a, in a previous meeting, get behind the people's front doors so they understand what's cooking can make an informed choice and hopefully that choice will still be with public transport but as we say if we all take the car every single individual takes the car then we will have even further disruption and the wheels are on the other side could not grind to a halt but certainly be slowed down so it's just a, a, a reminder of how important these things are and I, I, it looks like we're doing everything by the book loads and loads of planning i've always told and it, you can't spend too much time on planning because the end result is right it looks like we get those individuals will uh, have some disruption. And that will reflect on our reputation anyway, because they will want to blame someone. So, you know, whoever closes the tunnel down, we'll, 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 we'll get some adverse publicity, but it, is going to, it has got to be done uh, for the long-term future of, of, of the tunnel. So I'm, I'm, I'm assured more now by hearing your presentation that, that the consultation process looks like it's begun in earnest today. Well, just pick up on that point, Chair, yeah. the part of the vision, the replacement bus services, the ferries option, so our prediction on the model is that there will be greater use of the ferries. The commercial operators are looking to enhance the frequency of the cross-river services. And uh, all of those mitigations are to try and alleviate the impact of what is essential works. I think the, the real, I suppose, challenge on this is, is, is really the... Uh, transport demand messaging and hitting the right buttons on that because it's that that will dictate whether we do get the book 10% turned into cars and that will be challenging through the tunnel. Dr. Ron, then I've got Les, then I've got Cherry.
sure that as a city region we're joined up in this, not just that men's support should come a really, really uh, reinforced to the media, not by us, by other people within the city region. Um, and if we can't promise what the communications or the media coverage will get will be like, but it is important that one, they give the right tone and recognise this important investment. But secondly, the media have also got a really important role to play in getting that information out to customers and getting them to look for websites and getting them to pick up the requested accounts. And we'll continue, obviously, um, all partners will continue to do that and we will look forward to the 3rd of January. And then obviously, once the discussion is ongoing, the communication is really important. That's a shame to just the TCC. Monitors will be I mean, they'll reimburse, they'll be reimbursed uh, in terms of uh, peak travel. It's worth saying that on the ferries, um, the capacity in the, with, um, you know, uh, three an hour for, for the trips between Tico and uh, Liverpool, and it's, uh, you know, you're not talking about more than 10% of the capacity just at the moment. So we've got that in capacity in there. So our forecast is easily accommodated. So, but it's there to promote the ferries, but it's, 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 it's something about the messaging, because the service is in there. <coughs> Taking advantage of what we've got in the existing service that's, that's got quite a bit of capacity. Uh, so, the, the tickets, there is a reimbursement. Uh, I think I touched on it slightly earlier with the schedule forecast, which are at compensation costs. So, but what it might do, because it takes time to work through that, if there is an addition, that's why we have that pot of money. So, if there's something to sort out, we'll sort out the cost and breakdown later, because now we've got a certain process and it can take quite a bit of time to get a finalised decision out of it on that side. Uh, in terms of impacts on the northern line, is the uh, any freight movement etc is at night and, uh, so they, you know that's what they do but, so they don't disrupt uh, services during the day anyway for passengers i think it's also important to note that's mainly for kind of maintenance reasons that um when the work is going on effectively we cut off one side of the maze around that network from the other and all of the trains need to be within a certain time when they get their maintenance exams and things like that so they need to get back to work and have normal so that's what it's all about, to make sure we don't have trains that effectively run out of their exam time and run used. So it, won't, it shouldn't disrupt any of the kind of the passenger timetable, purely to make sure that 
Excellent. Thank you, Chair. It's just to add to some of the comments already made, and we need to see it as a good news story. So I totally agree with what you're saying, Liz, in terms of briefing the, um, the different media personnel. Because although there's going to be, you know, forecasting massive disruption, it's a good news in terms of what's going to be done for the new rural line. And basically, the more positive stories in terms of we can get across um, economically, um, and in terms of the ferries, and in terms of the cyclists, you know, that's how we have to sell it. Because there are people who are going to be, you know, making it into the disruption in terms of bad news. But basically, we need to push the positive things that's going to come out of it. Absolutely. Um, and I think that if you captured all those points brilliantly naturally as everyone else has as well, that at the end of the day, um, this is going to cause disruption. Let's not kind of hide from that fact. It will take people longer to make their journeys than it does when everything's running smoothly. But um, I think we've got to recognise that there's a variety of reasons why it has to happen this way. As Gordon said, we went down to the dance floor, which just for the avoidance of doubt is suspended ceiling. Uh, near um, Central Station where they're actually doing maintenance work. It's not a new nightclub around the back of the, the Lewis's building. Um, and as part of that visit, one of the things we were very, very keen to, to do is push Network Rail very hard to say, why are you doing it in this way? And this actually is the least disruptive way we can do this work. Um, if they chose to do it in other forms of uh, possessions, you'd be looking at five years of continuous closures on the uh, five years of continuous weekend closures on the Wirral line, which would be much more disruptive than do it in this in this period of time as well. We've also got to remember that um, the unique sort of the environment that we have with regard to the sort of tunnels that go underneath the river and underneath the uh, the city, um, and because of, of that, it also means that from an engineering perspective, it's challenging to do. But once we've done this work. Actually, we won't need to do anything as substantial as this again for another 40 years. So the next time this has to be revisited, it will actually be our grandchildren that are dealing with it. So six months of difficult periods actually means that we won't be coming back to that uh, for decades to come is another good thing that we've got to sort of bear in mind. Now, whilst yes, it is going to cause disruption and it will mean that it takes people longer, particularly to get from one side of the river, to the other, particularly in the first six weeks. I think one of the things we do need to remember is all of this is actually manageable. We've got a really good plan in place. Um, as long as we keep on pushing that message of stick with public transport, don't jump in your car, actually when you start to look at it in peak hours, all it would mean is one extra bus in the tunnels every three minutes. That's really manageable. So let's make sure we kind of keep our focus on that. But the key point, absolutely, is making sure that not that we've got this great plan in our back pocket is that we actually tell people very so openly, very honestly, and in the right detail to all the right levels of people um, to make sure that they can, sort of, in a timely fashion, really plan how they're going to kind of um, go about their journeys during this period of disruption. So it's great that we're starting that now. We've got a good three months uh, to really kind of ingrain that into uh, commuters and travellers. Uh, side kids sort of misquote the previous Prime Minister, our priority has to be communication, communication, and communication. But we're in a really good place to crack on with that. And it's not just down to the offices to do this. One of the things we've all got to do, we're advocates, we've got to make sure we're parroting that message uh, accordingly as well. So if there's no further questions or comments, if I can move the recommendation in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. Um, item 8 is the Bus Alliance update, and, and that's presenting that for us. Thanks, Chair. Um, the report you've got in front of you hopefully does three things. Firstly, it's to, uh, as we've been widely trailed now, communicate the needs that we've signed our landmark alliance agreement with the Union State Coach. Uh, secondly, it's to remind members about the work and what we've set out to achieve. Uh, thirdly, it's to remind um, members about the governance of the Alliance and how the management and governance arrangements will work and keep you informed and how we're going to uh, keep you informed about the Alliance's progress over, over time. So, just by 
Sorry. Um, by way of some background, um, really, members will remember that we now have uh, a bus strategy in place for the city region that's in line with uh, Rosa Travel's corporate priorities and our kind of multimodal um, approach to strategy. Um, what that um, bus strategy does is, is three things. Uh, it sets out, firstly, um, the vital importance of bus to the whole city region. It sets out um, some of the challenges and some of the opportunities for bus. And it also sets out the city region's aspirations for, uh, for bus services as well. We know, uh, we've talked about many times before, that uh, bus is vital to the uh, economic success of the city region and vital to its uh, social capacity in that, um, that the most vulnerable people in society rely the most on bus services. But we also know um, that the long-term trend of bus patronage in this region has been one of decline because of that importance to the economy and to, to society. It, that's the reason why we need to take action to, uh, to address and, and reverse this trend. So that's, why, that's where very much where the Alliance comes in. Uh, the Alliance is a partnership between ourselves and initially um, the State Church and Areva, but we do hope that more operators over time we'll, uh, we'll come and join the Alliance and, and get behind what, what we want to do. Um, the formation of, uh, of the Alliance is really centred around achieving growth in fair paying patronage and we want to do that through improving the bus off customers in a much more coordinated way um, through partnership. Our aims are to have a thriving and uh, affordable bus network where customers are getting value for money from bus services and also a hassle free we want to see bus established much more for people as a mode of choice and through that encourage fair pay and patronage uh, growth. We've brought the Alliance to members at, um, at various stages of its development, uh, most notably in December last year when, uh, when you gave your authorisation for us to develop the partnership proposals to, to the next step with the bus operators. And then early this year in April um, when you endorsed the detail of what we uh, what we pulled together and what we proposed for the Alliance and set out the roadmap to, um, to, to, get, uh, to deliver the uh, agreements and, and get the approvals necessary. All that process has now been uh, finished and, and, and signed off. So what we have in place now is, um, is a joint business plan for the Alliance, a joint investment plan, a series of milestones and performance indicators, and the voluntary partnership agreement which is the extensive um, legal agreement that underpins um, what we're trying to achieve through the Alliance and, uh, and, and really formalises the commitment that everyone's going to make within that. And then associated agreements around uh, sharing of data and uh, enabling um, ticketing developments as well. Um, the Alliance itself um, is, will operate on a three-year rolling basis, uh, but what it said is that first two years uh, of that, we, won't, we wouldn't serve uh, notice on that agreement. In terms of what we set out to do now, um, what we'll see is an initial £25 million pounds of investment uh, in the bus offer for the city region um, this financial year, um, and then we will uh, be very shortly commencing the process for uh, for business planning for next financial year as well to set out what, uh, how we want to build on the initial things that we've, uh, we've decided we want to do in that initial work and also to establish uh, 
experience of on bus, improved customer experience, uh, traveling perception of on bus, and off bus as well to improve customer confidence by making it more easy and straightforward for customers to get information, receive information, and provide feedback about the service. And then finally, in terms of the smarter ticketing, again, a, a simpler, easy to understand, customer focused, um, smarter bus offer. In the appendix of, uh, of the report, the alliance is really managed through uh, what is a comprehensive and robust uh, governance structure. You'll, you'll see how, how that all um, pieces together in the, in the appendix. But in terms of the alliance uh, board itself, um, that's going to be chaired by uh, Stephen Joseph, who's chief executive of the campaign for better transport. Uh, it's going to have the managing directors for the UK divisions of both the Reaper and Stagecoach. Bus, as well as the lead up to transport for the Liverpool City region. One of, it's going to have one of the directors, the passenger director for, for transport focus, representing um, representative customers, and also representative from the local enterprise partnership, really representing that local economic view, and making sure that that's translated across uh, across the bus. So that's that's really the good news of, uh, of where we sat now. The alliance is already starting to deliver improvements to the bus offer. Examples such as the uh, enhancements to the 500 service to the airport, the new 24 hour bus route that we see both across the river uh, and 86 and 86A. But now that the agreement side as well, we can really start to, uh, to, to motor on with the rest of the, uh, of the plan that we've got to deliver a better bus service for the people of the city. franchising model will, will fit into that bus bill uh, and what the uh, caveats will be in, in it, but that's only my personal thing. But I think huge credit goes to the officers. There's been a, a blunt end of negotiating with some very difficult people in the bus industry uh, and I just once again throw off and thank them for where we are and hopefully we'll take this on to bigger and better things.
trends we've seen actually over the last probably the last 10 years is a decline in antisocial behaviour on buses. It's one of the reasons why historically you've seen a lot of single deck buses in, in the region because antisocial behaviour was such a problem. Now you see every new bus that comes into the region a double decker and that's because the operators now have confidence that they can have that sort of vehicle and that antisocial behaviour can be managed. Things like CCTV, having screens at the front of buses showing people that they're on the CCTV have made a massive difference to that. So we would hope that, and would be, it would be a real shame if antisocial behaviour was, was to spoil it, but I think we've got quite a lot in place now to be able to deal with it. Thank you. 